Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce today our 15th president, Dr. Daniel Porterfield. Since he joined FNM in 2011, he has helped the college implement a strategy that has expanded FNM's inclusiveness and diversity in many ways. Last week, in fact, he was honored by the White House as a champion of change for college opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Porterfield. In addition, we welcome Dr. Beverly Tatum, President Emerita of Spelman College and a renowned author, speaker, and expert on issues related to racial identity. We are deeply honored to welcome Dr. Tatum today to Franklin and Marshall College. Dr. Tatum. <laughs> Dr. Tatum is perhaps best known as a nationally recognized authority on racial issues in America. She's the author of the critically acclaimed book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. Since its original publication in 1997, this book has been listed on the Independent Bookstore bestseller list and was selected as the Multicultural Book of the Year in 1998 by the National Association of Multicultural Education. I can think of no one better to help us set the tone for FNM's Day of Dialogue. Please join me in thanking Dr. Tatum and welcoming her to Franklin and Marshall. I think it's a wonderful thing to be having a day of dialogue here at Franklin and Marshall, and I think it's something that probably a lot more institutions should do. But my first question is really for you, Dan, and that is why are you having this now? So um, let me thank everybody who's here, all of the organizers, the faculty, the students, the staff that uh, have been planning this since last spring. And it's so exciting to see all of the, um, the ideas come together into this day. And uh, if you wind back the clock, uh, as a community, we made the decision to have a day of dialogue last year uh, as we were participating in a national conversation about inclusiveness and discrimination, about identity and community, uh, about who we are and who we hope to become. And we had a number of different kinds of convenings throughout uh, the fall and the spring semester. And we made efforts to, uh, to change in different ways in some of our approach to orientation, to faculty recruitment, to thinking together about how we really bring people into conversation. Well, the faculty uh, taking part in all those conversations said, wouldn't it make a statement to the school if we said, let's take a day where we you know, reschedule classes at the end of the semester so that we can really center ourselves on the idea that the community that we create and sustain here defines us as learners, as citizens, as humans, as friends, let's really focus in, let's really lean in to the idea that we are all in relationship with one another. We are all partners in trying to create a great school and a great society. We are all bound up in the American project, which has in it so much history of freedom and also so much history of discrimination, of racism and structural inequality, other forms um, of, of limiting freedom. Let's, let's center ourselves for a day where we share perspectives, where we listen to one another, where we set a goal to be able to go forward as a community in diversity, unity in diversity. Let's learn together, not have one day of dialogue, but catalyze deeper inquiry together as a part of who we are, our very core. And so look at this, you can see this is like the will of the community, everyone is here. Uh, because this is the conversation that matters for us as people. It matters for this country and this world so much. So that was part of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of the good things that have happened the past couple years here, as we have developed a talent strategy that's allowed us to become so much more inclusive as a school, strengthening our academic profile at the same time that we're drawing students from you know, many more parts of the country and the world. Much of it goes back to you um, okay. for several reasons. First, you wrote a defining book that made um, a generation of educators realize that we had to work intentionally about building community, uh, attending to the dynamics of sameness and difference, opening ourselves to one another, being ready to change and acknowledge silences and problematic histories, um, as well as looking forward. So that was part of it. But then also, when I was, the first year I was president, I took a pilgrimage to Atlanta <laughs> Uh, and uh, asked if uh, Dr. Tatum would see me. 
And we sat down one to one, and she, mm -hmm. she probably wasn't going to mention this, but I, I wanted to seek her out because she is one of the leaders in higher education, and even broadly in society, in thinking about how, do we, how, does, how does the American project come true for all people in the future? And you gave me so many good ideas about what we could do as a school. Um, and I think the thing that I really took away was your, your reminding me that the country needs the top schools to attend to the inequalities and the opportunities in our society. And, and I, I felt like after meeting with Dr. Tatum, um, this school was ready to be a leadership school in this space. So thank, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me ask you now, um, you have, you have, you're one of the great scholars in the country on community and diversity dialogue. And there are great opportunities in dialogue around our, our, our identities, our communities, and there also are challenges, and it can be hard sometimes. Um, I think everyone in this room acknowledges that we, are, we have identities of identity, we have many identities within our identity, and we have many communities in our community. Dialogue should be easy, but it's not easy all the time. So can you give us any thoughts about that? Sure, well let me just say, I wanna talk for a moment about why it's so hard, yeah. because it is hard. And while, um, as I said at the beginning, I think having a day of dialogue is a wonderful thing. It really centers, yeah. as you said. But let's all be clear, it's not enough by itself, mm. right? You know, so a day of dialogue ought to be weeks and months of dialogue, you know, in terms of really having the time and opportunity in classrooms and outside of classrooms to engage across lines of difference. And one of the reasons why it is so hard is because in the United States, and I realize not everybody's from the US, yeah. but I want to focus for a moment on the US, in the United States, there is still a lot of separation by race and increasingly also by class. And so if you think about the fact that I wrote that book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race in 1996. I'm working on a 20th anniversary update of that book to be released in fall 2017. Nice. Yes. And uh, one of the things that I've been reflecting on this year while I'm working on that project is what's different in the last 20 years. And part of the answer is not much. And so, and, and when I say that, um, neighborhood segregation is yeah. very well established in the U.S., and that hasn't changed very much. There are small pockets where you can see more integration across lines of difference. They tend to be places like where military bases are located, or sometimes where university communities are, because as they attract a diverse student body, then you get a diverse neighborhood around yeah. it, or a diverse workforce. But beyond those exceptions, Residential segregation is well institutionalized, as is school segregation. Despite the fact that we're now 60 plus years past the Brown versus Board of Education decision, schools are more, public institutions are more segregated today than they were 20 years ago. So that means that most people coming to college, not just here at Franklin and Marshall, but everywhere, are coming from neighborhoods or school settings where there's been very limited opportunity to truly engage in meaningful ways with people whose backgrounds are significantly different from their own. Yeah. And so that means that there's a lot of information, or maybe I should say misinformation, about people other than ourselves, which is often based in stereotypes, which we maybe have gotten through the media, or the jokes we hear people tell, or the comments we hear people make, and not our own direct experience. Yeah. And even when there has been direct experience, sometimes that direct experience is mediated or viewed through that lens of those preconceived yeah. notions we have. So we are not always able to truly understand what it is that we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. So in that context, College, this is one of the things I've written about in my next, the book after that, Why Are All the Black Kids? I wrote a book called Can We Talk About Race? In that book, I talked about the fact that the college and university environment is in some ways the last best opportunity yeah. for adults, in this case young adults, to really learn how to effectively communicate, interact with people different from themselves, but that only happens if we create those dialogue opportunities. Yeah. We can't just assume that you know, if you put a diverse group of people in the same geographic location, those relationships will happen automatically. 
sometimes they do. Roommates yeah. get to know each other, you know, sometimes. But more often than not, people tend to seek out those with whom they're already comfortable. Yeah. There's a great um, book that has just come out, I want to mention it, called Our Compelling Interests, mm -hmm. uh, published by the Mellon Foundation. Oh, yeah, I saw it. Yeah. And it is talking about the value of diversity. And one of the essays in it is by a sociologist named Danielle um, Allen, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering her name correctly. Mm -hmm. And she talks about connected society, that in order to have a functioning democracy, we have to have a connected society where people feel connected to one another. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, in order to make those social connections, we have to have what she calls bridging opportunities. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, in the world yeah. of psychology, sometimes we talk about the ability to be a border crosser. Yeah. You know, somebody who knows how to connect across those demarcations of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, religion, all the things that separate us to really engage in a meaningful way with people whose experience is different and start to learn about yeah. it so that we can, in a more um, informed way, really develop what hopefully will become bonding relationships, yeah. feeling as though these people matter, what's in their lives is part of my life too, and I need to make sure it's working. Do, do you feel that one can intentionally choose, prepare oneself to become a border person? Yes. A bridge builder? Yeah. Um, you can, and I think there are probably people in this room who are doing that as we speak, and it's not easy because we all have misinformation, we got these stereotypes in our heads, we you know, worry that if I say something, I'm gonna say the wrong thing, I'm gonna offend somebody, yeah. And the truth is, you might. I like to say that you know, if you live in a smoggy environment, you know, our environment is full of what I'm going to call cultural smog. If you live in a smoggy environment, you're going to breathe a lot in. Don't be surprised if you breathe some out, yeah. right? I mean, it's just going to happen. But at the same time, if you do that in a way that um, is sincere and genuine, people will forgive you for making mistakes if you are sincere and genuine in your effort to learn. Yeah. And recognizing that it's not just other people who make mistakes, you make too. mistakes, yeah. right? You know, we all make mistakes. And so if we uh, approach it with the spirit of generosity, that, you know, I'm learning, you're learning, we're all here to learn, uh, then it's a little bit easier. I think that's the idea of the day of dialogue, exactly that spirit. And it takes a little bit of a risk for we who are older, for faculty and for other educators, our staff, to do this too, don't you think? It's, oh. not, I mean, it's not just kids that have to learn. <clears throat> There's no question. Yeah. I mean, certainly one of the things I had to learn as a faculty member when I, I, taught, I started teaching a course on the psychology of racism when, in 1980. Yeah. I, you know, at the time was 26 years old sure. and uh, thought I was ready to teach that class. The short answer is I was not, yeah. right? I made a lot of mistakes and, you know, I'm sure if I were teaching it today, I'd still be making mistakes, hopefully not the same ones I made then. But the fact of the matter is we're, you know, it's a continual journey. Nobody's ever finished. Yeah. You know, there's always new stuff to learn and you have to just be open. But I think people um, appreciate that openness when you are clearly trying to move um, the ball forward in the right direction. Yeah. One of the things I love about working here and being an educator in general is that as an adult, continuously developing, continuously in formation, I learn so much from our students. Yeah. I become a better spouse, a better parent, a better citizen as students share with me their perspectives, their experiences, including, with trust, their pain, something yeah. difficult they've gone through, or their, their hopes for something to change in their lives or in the society we're a part of, that that makes me more alive, more yeah. human, more aware. Um, but there's also always that risk that if you're not listening to the people you're engaged with, that you're reproducing old ways of thinking. Yeah, I used to do a lot of workshops with educators, yeah. um, K through 12 as well as higher ed, and I still do some of those. And one of the things that um, teachers used to say, I'm thinking now about the K through 12 teachers in particular, was, uh, and one of the concerns they had is that, you know, what if I do or say something and a student or a parent or somebody calls me a racist? Yeah. And I used to say, well, why, what would that feel like? And this is, a, I'm thinking of a conversation with a white teacher and that teacher said, I would feel like I'd been punched in the stomach. 
And, you know, it was like a visceral yeah. thing, you know, like, it's like, she said, if somebody called me a racist, it would be like, you know, calling me scum of the earth. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a very loaded term, and of course we know that it is, and people do worry about that. But then I said to her, I said, well, what, um, we talked about what should she do if that happened, you know? And my advice always is, I mean, the first response many people have is to defend. I'm not, not a racist bone in my body, not a prejudiced bone yeah. in my body. You know, how many of you have heard somebody say that? Yeah. I always like to say, look again, you know? <laughs> um, which is not to say that you're a bad person. That comes back to that smog breathing. You know what I mean? If you've been breathing the smog, it gets in your body, right? But the fact of the matter is what I said to her, and I would say it here because I know that people worry about this. My students told me this a lot. If someone says, you're racist, you're homophobic, you're anti-Semitic, you're classist, whatever it is, the best response, in my opinion, is not to say, I couldn't possibly be. The best response is to say, why do you think so? Yeah. What have I done that gave you that impression? Yeah you know, to ask for more information. Because it may be that you did say or do something that gave someone that impression and you need that feedback. Exactly. If you just shut down and say, couldn't possibly be true, you know, I'm yeah. immune from yeah. such possibility. Yes. <laughs> you know, well, we all have that possibility. Yeah. And so the question to just, so I would just say in this day of dialogue, if someone gives you feedback you don't like, ask, why do you think so? Yeah. It's very liberating, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Instead of trying to build a facade, a yeah. you know, architecture, hey, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. Instead, like, how can I grow? And, and you don't have to agree with their assessment, yeah. but you can ask for more information. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, but I have a question okay, for you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so here's my question. So we were talking about border crossing, and one of the things we know we, meaning psychologists, social scientists, one of the things we know is that people who are effective border crossers are more likely to grow up in families where border crossing has been modeled. Mm. And so I'm curious about that, because clearly you're invested in creating yeah. a community of border crossers. What's your experience with border crossing? Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I was very lucky in that I, I grew up in Baltimore City. I was born in 1961, and I came to I guess I'd say early social and political consciousness in the late 60s and the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my family, my parents were married and we lived in a community where we were one of a couple white families, a predominantly African American neighborhood. And we just grew up there and just had, you know, like a childhood there, no, normal childhood with friends mm -hmm. and everything. And uh, I went to a public school that was an, an integrated public school uh, for elementary school. And when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968 and, and Senator Kennedy was assassinated, a lot of people my parents' age had a very, very difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, and the, their, the, the chaos of the 60s caused our family to break up. Um, and neither of my parents had, had, were going to college. My mom moved in with her children, with me and my sister, into a different neighborhood, maybe eight blocks away in Baltimore. Um, this neighborhood, uh, was this sort of the same economically, um, working class people, uh, all living in these row houses, but this neighborhood was 100% white. Not an not a African American person or, or any other identity there except people who are white. They worked at McCormick Spices and Black and Decker, uh, this place called Sparrows Point, you know, working class Baltimore community. They, they all owned their houses and they had bought their houses. They hadn't owned, they, they're, they're very proud of that. Um, so my, my mom and our family had many friends who were African American, and they would come to our house. And people in the neighborhood didn't, some, some people didn't like that. Um, and I'm just, just gonna say this pretty bluntly, people would like write, wrote graffiti on our sidewalk, mostly about my mom. And there were a couple times when, um, as a boy, like 10 or 11, um, I had to defend myself. I had to actually like, with other boys, and when older boys kind of watching, I had to like fight sort of to protect myself. Um, and it was, that was just a very hard neighborhood. And mm -hmm. I, there was a lot of, I went through a lot of reflection about how did I get in this world on this, this place right here. When I was about 11, uh, a family from Kenya, a doctor, his, his wife, and their two children moved in. Now I know that they had been 
African Americans, African families, black men have been prevented from moving in this neighborhood for years, but, but they moved in. And the focus of the neighborhood was the, those that didn't, uh, that were racist, was not on us anymore, it was on them. And people threw tomatoes at their houses and eggs and they, like, you know, wrote terrible things and tried to drive them out. Um, and um, my mom like, brought them casseroles and got to, tried to get to know them. And it was like, a, you really saw, just to say it very directly, there were two ways of being white. Mm -hmm. There were two ways. Some, some people threw things at someone's house and some people brought them casseroles. And then about, with over, over, in about six months, half the neighborhood moved away. They sold the only houses they had owned. They moved to Baltimore County, to all white areas. Um, and so again, like two ways of being white. Um, half didn't leave. And I was about 11 and I just chose. I, I, I want to be the person that doesn't move away. I want to be the person like my mom that brings the casseroles. Um, and I also understood that I was kind of protected from racism because I was white in a way that that family was not. I just understood that. I just learned that. I was lucky to see that. And so that has been probably at the core of my identity since then. I know there's a, there's a lot more to learn than what you know when you're 11, but I was lucky to see models of being white and to have to choose which model are you. And the model I've chosen has made me very fulfilled. So thank you for asking. Yeah, it's a powerful you. story. Thank you. Um, how about you? Well, as I'm listening yeah. to your yeah. story, I'm thinking about my experience. I grew up in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, which is a small town about 30 miles south of yeah. Boston. And um, my family, I was born in 1954, mm -hmm. the year of Brown versus Board of Education, yeah. in Tallahassee, Florida. And my father was a professor at a school historically black college in Florida, in Tallahassee, Florida a and And I always like to tell this story because it just helps illustrate for me, it reminds me of how things have changed, but also the work we still need to do. So in 1954, even though the Brown versus Board Supreme Court decision said that there should, you know, segregation was illegal and schools had to desegregate, the state of Florida, like a lot of southern states, took its time about implementing that. And what that meant for my dad was that he had, um, he was an artist and he had a undergraduate degree from Howard and a master's degree in art mm -hmm. from uh, University of Iowa, yeah. which he got in 1951 and now he's teaching and it's 1954 and he wants to get a doctorate in art education. And they have a program in art education at Florida State University, which is also in Tallahassee, right. like, you know, across town from Florida A&M. But he could not go there because it was segregated. And even though the Supreme Court had outlawed segregation, the state of Florida still had this policy and he wasn't able to go there. So the state was required to provide accommodation for this potential graduate student, and the way they did that was pay his transportation to Pennsylvania, wow. actually. Um, so wow. my dad got his doctorate at Penn State. Wow. And he finished it in 1957, and at that point, he and my mom, I have a brother, an older brother, who was just about to become school age, and they were determined not to have him educated in segregated schools. So they sought to get out of the Deep South yeah. and moved to Massachusetts in 1958, where my father became the first African-American professor at Bridgewater State College, now Bridgewater State University. So what's interesting about that, you know, is um, reflecting on some of those experiences because I was four years old when we moved to Bridgewater and my father used to tell the story of how they found housing in Bridgewater. So imagine this, um, they're living, first they were living in Florida, then they moved, before we moved to Massachusetts, yeah. we spent one year in Louisiana. My dad taught for one year at Southern University in Baton Rouge. And so that's where we were, and there my parents are getting ready to go from Louisiana to Massachusetts, and uh, he's concerned about housing. And so he wrote to every minister in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, asking for advice about housing, yeah. you know, and like where should they look or, you know, just, I guess he thought, you know, ministers would be helpful. And of all the people he wrote to, only one replied. Yeah. But the one who replied was a Unitarian minister in the town 
And that guy not only replied but said, you can come and stay in our house because we're going to be away for several weeks in the summer. And why don't you come here? You can get the key from the next door neighbor. And that's what we did. Yeah. Actually, we went and we stayed at that minister's house who became a lifelong friend of my parents. But, um, and then they you know, needed to buy a house. So we bought a house um, walking distance from where my father worked in the house I grew up in. They lived in that house for 50 years. But my parents had to navigate yeah. and, um, you know, the, the all-white neighborhood that's not receiving a black family, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, I, you know, at four, I don't remember any graffiti or stuff, yeah. though I'm told, and I wasn't told this until I was in my 20s, that there was some. Yeah. Right, but I didn't know about it as a four-year-old, and that there was a neighbor who was our neighbor our whole lives, and but my parents never told me about it. That circulated a petition to try to um, prevent our family from moving in, but of course it was just one neighbor. Um, both of my parents have recently passed away, and w uh, in response to an obituary posting on Facebook, someone who had grown up in the same neighborhood that I grew up in posted a story that I'd never heard, but she talked about how when our family was moving in, um, a realtor went around talking to the white families mm. about, you know, maybe you want to sell your house, you know, black families moving in. I mean, all the stuff that yeah. you read about, right, was actually happening. And this person who posted this message on Facebook said, you know, that there were many times her father, she thought, she was critical of her father. She said, there were many times, you know, my, my father embarrassed me, I thought he was a jerk which is an unfortunate thing yeah. to put on Facebook, but, but she said, but I was very proud of this. She said, I was very proud of this. When that realtor came to our house, my father told him to get the hell off my porch, yeah. you know? And so um, she felt like, you know, his speaking up to say, you know, we don't, we're not interested in your negativity yeah. Yeah. Um, was really something that she took pride in. And so you developed your social and political consciousness, your, your different kinds of identities, just as I did growing up in the yeah. forces of history. Things yes. happen around yes. us that we don't control, and as little kids, we, we absorb them. Um, everybody here has lived, is living in history. In fact, I love sometimes hearing from students yeah. their stories about how their family came to America or how they came to the recognition that it was okay and safe to come out yeah. um, or how they came to the understanding that the protections of this country are supposed to apply to their family, yes. but don't fully apply. I really, really value those stories. Well, I wonder for you, you became an intellectual and you became a leading scholar of some of the forces that affected every African American in the history of this country to the present and your own family personally. Yes. And how did that happen, the, the development of your intellectual life and your orientation in your intellectual life to helping us understand prejudice and racism? That's a great question and I want to, it's a long story, yeah. so I'm going to try to be brief because right. I know we want to have time for everyone else to ask questions. Okay. But you know, when, particularly if we think about this from a scholarly point of view, yeah. if you ask scholars why they study what they study, you usually don't have to dig too deep to mm -hmm. find some autobiographical connection, yeah. right? So for me, I started my interest as a psychologist on the experiences of black youth raised in predominantly white communities. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Where did I get that yeah. idea, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I was very yeah. interested in that experience yeah. because when I went to college, I went to Wesleyan University, and when I went to Wesleyan and I was taking all these classes in psychology and in African American studies and other things, I read a lot about the experiences of black families in urban areas in uh, the South, but n nobody was writing about, you know, black families in small towns in New England. And I was interested in that experience. I knew I wasn't the only person having it. So I did my dissertation on the experiences of black families in a predominantly white community. Yeah. And that turned into my first book called Assimilation Blues. Yeah. And then um, that book, because it was about the experiences of black youth in predominantly white communities, was of interest to educators in the greater Boston area who were working with students in what was known as the MECO program. Yeah. That's a, inter, a voluntary deseg program and desegregation program in Boston. And those educators were like, you know, we've got black kids in a predominantly white school and we're seeing 
concerns about, you know, why are they all yeah. sitting together in the cafeteria was what they were always asking me, which is how I got to that <laughs> title. Um, and so I was very interested in that experience and the ways in which um, stereotype threat and lowered expectations were playing themselves out in those classrooms and the difficulty that the teachers, mostly white teachers, dealing with kids of color perhaps for the first time, were so scared yeah. of really giving authentic feedback mm -hmm. and uh, calling parents at home and, you know, because they had all these misconceptions about who those people were because they had no direct experience. Yeah. So, you know, one thing led to another and I just wrote more and learned more and here we are. But the fact of the matter is, I want to come back to something you said about identities. Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, really shaped me, of course, was growing up in this predominantly white community, but then I went off to uh, Wesleyan and I had a wonderful learning experience there and then I went to Michigan and, you know, all those ex educational experiences, all the different places I've taught. One of the things that I learned was that we all have multiple identities, yeah. but some of them are more salient for us than others, mm -hmm. right? So I, if you were to ask me to describe myself, I always say I'm a black woman, right? I don't always say I'm a heterosexual black woman raised as a Christian, able-bodied, you know, yeah. in a middle-class family, you know, but all of those identities yeah. are part of my experience. And even as I think about my experience as a black woman in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, I might add to that a light-skinned black woman. Yeah in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, yeah. because I'm sure my experience as a light-skinned person is different than, you know, the handful of black students who were darker-skinned than me. Yeah. So we all have um, places where we are in the dominant group and places where we're in the targeted group. Yeah. Most of us, not everybody. Yeah. But even those people who can check off every box and say, I'm dominant in terms of gender, I'm dominant in terms of religion, I'm dominant in terms of sexual yeah. orientation, I'm dominant in terms of class, et cetera, et cetera, um, will eventually be old, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and or could have, a, you know, an accident and then find themselves with a disability, you know, so yeah. that our identities are fluid and can change. But one of the things that has helped me be more um, generous in my spirit with people who don't recognize their privilege yeah. is to understand and reflect on the times when I didn't recognize my own relative to, let's say, sexual orientation or even social class. You know, I often find when I was writing, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? I would make suggestions for things that people could do to multiculturalize their homes. And, you know, I realized somewhat belatedly as I was working on that book that, you know, all of it was sort of based on an assumption that you had money. Yeah. Right, you know, like what would you do if you didn't have resources? How would this apply if you couldn't go to the store and buy X? Um, you know, and so thinking about how our worldview is shaped by those identities and to the extent we overlook other people's experiences is I think something we all have to think about. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all that.